as allocated in the control rate for development of time energy and infrastructure uh, to Alpha Line as the nine. And the third example would be promotion of uh, renewable energy. Uh, and we talk I can talk about uh, uh, our target being our green uh, 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 our energy mix with uh, green forces to fifty percent. Uh, and this one aligns with uh, LGD seven. And our the fourth uh, alignment would be uh, the focus the focus of uh, on, on global global for development and about to be is a different as uh, it recognizes more than of uh, international cooperation from the start in some one of them. Now uh, let's uh, see how about is missing from um, uh, existing framework. Uh, there is also a lot of commonalities between existing frameworks and other. Um, what distinguishes about is its tailored approach to the unique context of it. And here we can highlight uh, about specifically targeting the unique challenges that we face as this, uh, such as extreme vulnerability, climate change, geographic isolation, limited approval, and on external markets. Second is uh, while Agenda 2030 broadly covers environmental sustainability and ocean conservation. About stated uh, emerging stronger and this uh, uh, issue. The third is uh, about addresses maritime security challenges, which are unique to our city. Uh, and this includes the participation of regional cooperation to combat maritime crime. What's the board and energy factors at the international, regional, and national level? Uh, I'm not, 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 I
project uh, relating to marine conservation, coral reef restoration, and management. I mean, if you are small country, small island, the middle of the ocean, you can do uh, all the development regional cooperation with uh, SMG from India. And uh, the third one is the early warning and development management. Um, I think that the third one is very much included in quite a few of us in this early warning project. Uh, that is happening. And if we could uh, uh, establish the regional network for early warning and the previous, it's going to be even better. And at the national level, uh, I said earlier, nothing is going to happen if there is not uh, a required public man by the, the national authority. Um, and then coming to it's something else. We need to deal with the things of our past. And the second thing that is also even more important, we need to involve all relevant stakeholders if we want uh, to succeed uh, in implementing uh, that. The second issue here is the uh, climate and environmental issues. Uh, we have not yet. We need to develop our national adaptation plan. Uh, or if we have one, we probably need to update and start with uh, property and comprehensive other kind of development. Third one is, like in the capacity building in the new and community design and here education and skills development would be uh very important to ensure the technical implementation. Moving on to uh, the next question. Is the Yeah. Okay. Uh, what best practices from Amoa pathway can be carried forward to effective implementation of ABA? Um, yeah, I'll focus this briefly and then we can probably discuss uh, later. The first is um, a strong international and regional partnership. Samoa uh, pathway emphasize uh, the importance of such partnership. So, uh,
first and foremost, Ahmed uh, uh, and uh, the area of my life, uh, working with the UN in Uh, see whether their strategy 
Thank you very much, Mr. Gopal. We do have a time, so thank you. We can elaborate on the slides later. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Majid Gopal. We have a uh, my permanent secretary, who is not in attendance due to other uh, commitments. So I will try my best to deliver this presentation to the best of my ability. So for uh, this presentation, I will be concentrating on so presentation focusing on how uh, Solomon Islands is localizing uh, the ABAS into our uh, national development strategy as well as our national planning uh, process. And I will also be highlighting some of the lessons uh, there from uh, some more pathway. So, uh, my presentation will include a brief. Uh, overview of Solomon Islands geographical and social economy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to review on the NBS 2016 to uh, 2035 and also uh, review the implementation uh, of the NBS as well as the localization of APAS into our national uh, process. And I will also highlight some of the lessons uh, from the South of Hartway, as well as providing an update on the current exercise that we are doing on the NPS review. Uh, So, in the case of our small business, children, people, and social so, I think we have to do some of my this activity in the southwest. I think actually we are going to 
So uh, this is uh, just an example of how we are mapping uh, our was in a national context. So we have the RBS object policy, and then we have the RBS management uh, strategies. As well as the development of the daily priorities and then we have the uh, us. So just to show you the picture of how the community at the national level. Now we will have a message from uh, Stavon Patway. So I think um, one of the lessons is the absence of our structured implementation monitoring and evaluation framework. The summary of it that the comprehensive framework to guide implementation of the summary pathway. This is now resulted in a certainty that we can have what we should be reporting and how the reporting should be conducted at the national level. Secondly, lack of dedicated money for implementation. The international level, there was some dedicated funding allocated for support and implementation of the Sano pathway. Second, the process will be a critical challenge, which should be a priority moving forward for effective implementation of MAPAS. And then, uh, as it also allocations and activities and activities. Those process are the most important to specifically our course of activities. And this is very crucial for our framework to ensure focus and result on the implementation. And finally, this is a question of the social issues. 
particularly among the relevant stakeholders, was committed. Increasing awareness and socialization efforts will be vital to ensure better understanding and action of the others. Just to give a brief on what we currently doing at the National of NBS. So, currently, our NBS is currently under review. We the compilation and validation of a transfer of the OPS. We are assessing the extent of the NBS Thank you uh, very much to the presenters uh, for the very insightful presentations. In particular, uh, the pathways they've shown or shared uh, towards localizing others to both the sub regional uh, and national level uh, and integrating the lesson uh, from the Star Wars last week. And I'm sure you'll have questions uh, with me over the for a short time uh, from the, the two presenters and, you know, and just reflections on what they've done. Uh, nationally, I, I would say that you know, on Solomon Island, I'm very impressed uh, about what you've done from the, the get go in, in terms of your man, uh, your family page. Uh, and we heard the plea from uh, development, your development partner about the fact that you do need uh, to be able to, uh, to implement uh, others. So let me just take a few minutes uh, just to discuss uh, from the ISCAPs. Uh, point of view, what we are uh, doing or could do in, in terms of um, supporting uh, the implementation of other. Um, and that's because the, when we look at our own uh, UNS GAP strategic plan, there's uh, you know, really great alignment uh, with uh, you know, the key actual commitments uh, in other. Um, but of course, um, uh, is that, uh Position, there is still a good opportunity for us to enhance uh, our support uh, in terms of uh, resilience and uh, prosperity. And uh, our executive secretary has requested that we develop a strategy for supporting countries in special situations. And of course, that includes uh, that we're, we're working uh, on that. Um, 
So it was a page of uh, was uh, the uh, human history of strategic plan uh, and other, uh, you know, emphasize the same development, resilience and inclusivity. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, the mandate of ISCAP uh, is that as we build executive systems, uh, online platforms and databases and sharing of these practices across the uh, member states. A key area of other support is facilitating access to finance. Um, and for our part, uh, we can assist countries in terms of uh, leveraging international commitments for climate finance and development aid. And we have support countries to develop energy finance and climate. Uh, climate financing, uh, such as SDG linked squads and get to climate squad. Um, in terms of uh, climate action uh, and resilience, we have all sorts uh, that we can help countries uh, with in terms of uh, preparing uh, for natural disasters. And in terms of biodiversity and ocean sustainability, uh, we are gearing up and supporting the member countries of Asia and the Pacific for the 2025 Oceans Conference, and in particular, we are focused on ocean based uh, climate action. Uh, in terms of the evaluation, we will have a, a dedicated session uh, after lunch uh, on this. And we have very recently in the Pacific completed uh, implementing guidelines to assist uh, the extent. Uh, to develop a sound national integrated framework to monitor and evaluate national, regional, and global frameworks. And then finally, turning to partnership. Um, one of the key uh, sort of uh, messages that uh, I keep you know, saying to our Pacific uh, members is that to use UNSCAP uh, as you know, the Asia Pacific uh, Regional Forum because of the, the number of members we have. Uh, and it can be your sort of uh, gateway to the, you know, to the global forum. I know and I acknowledge that our Pacific states have been over many years very successful in going directly to New York. But I think we have not really fully utilized uh, the platform that ASCAP uh, can provide uh, for Pacific states in, in terms of advocating uh, and supporting uh, Pacific states. So with those few comments, let me turn to my uh, colleague from the Forum Association now then, to also just provide uh, some comments as, as a discussion uh, before we open the floor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, moderator, and uh, just to thank the uh, host government as well as the organizers of this event to for this opportunity to come and uh, share uh, some of the lessons in the development of the 2050 strategy uh, as well as the ways that we could also assist in terms of the implementation for us. Uh, I thought just to briefly provide some background on the 2050 strategy for the, those who may not be aware of it. Uh, so the 2050 strategy was endorsed by leaders back in 2022, uh, their meeting in Fiji. And the strategy itself really highlights the, the region's uh, high-level vision, as well as our approach to achieving that uh, high-level vision. Um, and the strategy itself is framed around seven thematic areas. Uh, and those uh, areas include uh, political leadership and regionalism, people-centered development, which includes uh, areas such as health, education, um, human rights, and culture. Uh, we also have uh, climate change and disasters, ocean and environment, uh, technology and connectivity, which also uh, are areas that align to the, the focus areas of our past and uh, the 2030 agenda. Um, so just in terms of the development of the strategy, uh, one of the key uh, highlights of development was really an inclusive and robust process, uh, really ensuring that the process was led by our member countries and guided by our partners, as well as our top agencies 
from being the Council of Regional Organizations in the Pacific, which includes uh, PIFs, uh, the uh, Pacific Community, SPC, and USP, we just name a few. Um, so, and that was really a, a, an important aspect of the development, was to ensure that it was a member-led process that uh, we ensure to in, we include uh, all of the issues and priorities from the national level. Uh, and this process was also supplemented by a mapping exercise which we did uh, with the member countries uh, to map their priorities for their national development plan. Um, in terms of the implementation plan, the first phase is underway. Uh, we have uh, the implementation plan was endorsed uh, in Cook Islands at the leaders' meeting in 2023. Um, and it's really uh, this first phase of the implementation plan will take us now to 2030 uh, before the next review. Um, leaders have agreed that 2024 is a year of transition as the region works together to implement the priorities and decisions from ministerial level all the way up to our leaders. Uh, in addition to the implementation plan, uh, one of the key taskings from uh, Pacific leaders was the review of the regional architecture, which is uh, really um, the process where we will look at our own region, the various governing mechanisms and institutions that exist, and how we can better align to the priorities uh, under the, the 2050 strategy. Uh, so this is an ongoing process. Uh, this tasking came for, to the Secretariat as well as our crop agencies uh, to help uh, facilitate this process. Um, and uh, we are currently in the third phase of the review of the regional architecture. Uh, this also includes a review of our partners within the region uh, and how we, the partners can better align uh, and help implement the 2050 strategy. Uh, in terms of the MEL, for the 2050 strategy, we have in the implementation plan a set of high level uh, uh, principles which were endorsed by leaders. Uh, these principles we have started to unpack uh, through a MEL working group, which consists of our members from both planning and statistics office, as well as our uh, MEL experts from our crop agencies uh, to help to support this process. Um, so, the MEL approach as well within the 2015 implementation plan also highlights our failure of change, how we achieve from our system outcome, how we achieve the uh, system outcomes to help achieve our people uh, outcomes as well as uh, the overall goal and each of the next 12 years. Uh, and as I had mentioned, as part of the MEL process is the National Development Plan uh, mapping. Um, and this is a continuous pro process that we are doing with the countries. Uh, some are coming towards the end of uh, the uh, uh, National Development Plans and are planning new ones. Uh, and there are others that are still, uh, have just developed. So it's just ensuring the alignment as well as ensuring that the 2050 strategy helps support the achievement of national priorities. Um, and then just finally on the reporting to leaders. Uh, so this year in Tonga, uh, leaders had endorsed the first phase of reporting, which we are calling a baseline report. Uh, and it really sets out uh, where we are as a region in terms of our progress towards uh, in terms of our progress towards our goals and outcomes outlined in the 2050 implementation plan. Uh, in addition to the baseline report, we also have a um, high-level summary of prioritized regional collective action. So within the implementation plan, if you do manage to get a copy, uh, which I, I think are displayed outside, we have our goals, our outcomes, and we also have under each thematic area, a set of regional collective actions 
we could help so uh, help us in achievement of our, our dated outcomes. Um, in terms of the the report uh, or, or this high level summary of prioritized action, uh, our members had uh, identified around 26 regional collective actions that they have prioritized to implement uh, between 2024 and 2025. So in terms of resourcing, uh, in terms of partnerships and how we achieve our actions, we are really working with our member countries um, to help uh, get as much support as we can for these uh, regional collective actions. Uh, and then just finally on the 2050 dashboard, uh, the 2050 dashboard was really uh, work that we have been doing with the uh, SPC to the Pacific Data Hub. Uh, and we have been working with the statisticians there in SPC to really identify key indicators uh, from the SDG set of indicators that align to the, uh, the outcomes within the 2050 strategy. So we have uh, developed a dashboard with launched in Tonga and it's uh, up if anyone wants to view it. Um, and it really shows how countries uh, individually are progressing towards uh, achieving the outcomes within the within the 2050 strategy. Uh, in terms of alignment and support, I mean, the 2050 strategy really highlights the key uh, areas or key issues uh, from member countries terms of what member countries want to achieve in the Pacific. Uh, and we look forward to working with the, the UN uh, through the review of the regional architecture process and through other uh, mechanisms to ensure that uh, we can highlight or list and also use existing mechanisms such as the dashboard to help support the, the data and information uh, uh, within the Thank you very much.
I'm just I'm just taking the vow. I'm just taking a present on my family's death. If not, I'll, I'll take the place to take it. Okay. If not, I'll just get a little bit of Chris that you know, when he's doing his intervention in the next session, we just spend a minute talking about the intervention. So, is anybody else uh, just checking the, the room? Okay. So, uh, our staff member back in the UK. Right. Okay. Testing one, two. Uh, okay. Good. Thank you, um, moderator, for the session, and really um, thanks to the government of Vanuatu for the very good hospitality. My name is Ken Roy Roach. I'm the um, head of the resident coordinators office for Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, good to be here. Um, I really enjoyed, I wanted to comment on the presentation from uh, Mauritius. I really enjoyed the presentation uh, in terms of the, the, the substance and the ideas that were put on the table, but I wanted to zoom in on one aspect that you mentioned, um, because I think it might be helpful to the national focal point. You know, we are going through the, um, the NDC formulation process uh, globally uh, many countries are looking at their NDCs and updating their NDCs, and there's an expectation that those will be filed, um, will be um, registered by February 2025. And I think it's a good opportunity to think about um, how to land some of the um, environment and climate um, related um, commitments under the ABAS so that these processes are somehow integrated especially given that for SID, uh, they're very limited capacity. And I think this was partly the thinking behind um, in the presentation from Mauritius when we talked about the climate and environment policies and looking at the national adaptations. Um, of course, from a mitigation perspective, SIDs are not huge emitters, but from the adaptation perspective, there may be some opportunities there for looking at that. So I just wanted to flag that and really commend the presentation um, from from Mauritius, they thought it was quite thorough and comprehensive. Uh, I thought um, that the presentations were really interesting and really comprehensive. Um, I really also I really enjoyed the presentation from um, from Solomon Islands, and um, that I agree with Teresa as well. I think it's really fantastic that you've already socialized the um, ABAS and that you have incorporated those into your plan. Um, also because, you know, incorporating this ABAS into the national plan and so on makes sure that we can have the research into the different goals and so on that we're all talking about. And I just wanted to say because the one point that I already saw that I um, In the, um, I think you had a slide um, in the presentation from Marita looking at the different kind of relationships that the countries um, can have. Um, that you pointed out that the bilateral relationship with donors. So just from the point of view of a donor, um, I would just like to encourage that you also think about your relationship with donor partners in terms of also how that relates to other relationships. Because donors like the UK, um, we also have quite an important role, for example, in multilateral development banks with board members and so on as well. Um, and also in terms of our relationship with regional organizations. So, for example, some of our programming, which is quite so its focus, also goes through regional organizations, CARICOM bodies, for example, in the Caribbean, or through um, perhaps CISCAC or the Commonwealth, and so on, and other um, bodies which are, um, which mainly are regional, but also have an important Pacific threat and, and other organizations in the Pacific, for example. So the donor relationship with those organizations is also important. So we work to more advantage 
and some people still help people like me because um, we are I think, unusual in doing this and having an office bringing together the interests of the kids in our national administration, but helping to socialize the idea of our business priority also in our own administration. Um, which which supports our interventions, for example, working with SIDS, supporting the AOSIS, um, supporting the UN to um, um, to also um, pursue our objectives of SIDS. Also, FDF as well, I think the UN is the ability and the capacity building problems of SIDS with FDF and Bangkok um, in the run up to the war this year. So, I just would like to encourage this to think about your relationship with bilateral donors, also how you can leverage that as well in terms of the other relationship to achieve some goal. Thank you. <laughs> Just let me say that I'm happy to be here. Um, and thank you to discuss that last event at Fourth National Service Conference for the organizing of Also, thank you to the library student who will have been the their presentation. Um, we need to work on the last So, as I said, I, be, I just wanted to touch um, on Mauritius. Mauritius. Mauritius' point about the need for more private sector engagement. Um, I think that is a very key issue. I think a lot of implementation is usually left up to the government um, to be done, which can get a lot of So I think we need to um, develop more privacy strategies, um, especially um, to help you know, to de risk and improve more investments in you know, our climate um, adaptation. Close to all countries. Um, I think as well to we need to build more institutional arrangements because we know the GCM that are catching fund money to the industries. There is funding here, there is funding available. However, we as they still face the challenge of assessment because we don't have the proper institutional arrangements. Um, so I think a lot of it has to be focused on strengthening our institutional arrangements, stakeholder marketing plans, and other sectors. Good evening, everyone. Um, Chanel Hamilton from the Bahamas. Thank you to the government of Vanuatu for hosting this event. I have a question as well as a bit of a comment after what my colleague Maxi Grand Brother said about the procurement process and pool procurement. So with regards to WHO, I was just wondering what that pool procurement process was like and how it was mutually beneficial to all of the countries involved. Because as we mentioned, yeah, there are projects that are multi-country where a country like the Bahamas signs on but doesn't receive as much funding or as much technical as assistance that would be desired. So I'm just wondering what that WHO procurement process was like, and if we have any other examples of equitable procurement processes in the I'll, I'll just pass uh, the floor to our colleague the Mauritius, and I understand that we are going to also the room today, Mark. Uh, I think for the first one on the WSU, I leave our colleague from the WSU. But uh, I mean, the, the idea of improvement uh, relating to, to medication, medicine, came up after the challenges we faced during COVID. We had big challenges purchasing uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, to be able to protect our population. And, and it seems that one of the biggest um, challenge was actually the very small market. At the end of the day, even vaccination at some point in time, a lot of people. So, um, one way of uh, um, having a, a, a market size, which might be economically viable for, for people is to bring together uh, all the but, uh, I think probably our colleague from uh, 
the great slide talk about the details of the mechanism. And the second uh, mechanism that I just mentioned about the full group behind the architectural and food. Uh, that is the Indian route in which uh, we group the Mauritius, Comoros, Madagascar, Seychelles, and uh, Uranium Island in the French. And here we are talking about uh, for a small country like Mauritius, uh, all Seychelles, um, or Comoros, uh, which are very dependent on food. Uh, for their own security uh, And then you have a big uh, island, which is Madagascar, which uh, also produces uh, quite a uh, number of items uh, related to uh, uh, food. And Those are possibilities of working together, and this mechanism is now going to be developed. It's a very recent mechanism. Three four months of getting the field of law to uh, the Indian Ocean Commission and how we can get to better development. So, if I want to check if I have any other colleagues to comment and then we go to start more. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ilya Bo. I'm the head of office of the WHO based in here in Vanuatu. And uh, largely the UN agencies are reporting to uh, the UN agencies in Suba office. So, uh, in regard to your uh, comments, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to share uh, this. Um, how actually, what was the detail of having uh, this uh, procurement uh, for the procurement uh, in your country in like the other region? Uh, I don't have the detail, but probably uh, we can all revisit uh, um, and then remember that during the COVID time, it was largely started in 2020, and then I think right now in 2022. Uh, the WHO was the secretary for the COVAX facility. Because globally, uh, during this pandemic that affected all the every single country in the world, uh, there was a huge demand to match up the, the demand size and also the supply side, the story for the drugs, medicine, equipment, and also the vaccines going forward. Um, so the, during this time, actually, we were one, and then uh, it was uh, um, largely coordinated by the WHO headquarter, and then Dr. Tiberi State, all of you know, and then I was at the center of this coordination. Um, so the, uh, to, uh, many countries actually supported the uh, COVAX facility mechanism, and then uh, to have a full discussion, uh, particularly for the vaccine supply in our countries and also vaccine receipt by recipient countries. And also there were a huge coordination mechanism to be able to supply all the PPEs and uh, equipment test case and all these things actually uh, flew uh, uh, very smoothly from the donating country, donating agencies and private sectors into the countries with the supply mechanism. WAG is not the only agency who actually helped the, the process. For example, we also uh, teamed up with other UN agencies, the you know, the UNICEF, and then to uh, uh, have a uh, um, good collaboration uh, with their supply chain. So probably um, we can unpack this, how it, uh, the exact mechanism works, and then how we can actually make this, that kind of uh, rather easy a uh, supply mechanism for the sub region in the Pacific, the Caribbean, and other uh, these countries. Um, just one last comment. Um, for example, in the Pacific area, I'm sure that the same mechanism also exists in the Caribbean. When it comes to human resources and then drugs are regulatory mechanism, uh, is the uh, Pacific region works as a one block because there is a constant flow of human resources between countries and also the somehow the um, uh, the capacity uh, if it is the when we actually block all these countries in one uh, uh, block. So uh, we have we have been actually supporting for, uh, to create the kind of sub regional mechanism uh, to be able to govern that process. So probably this is also another uh, example uh, how we can actually take some example out of all the support implementation of our thank you very much. I could ask the best time too. Thank you very much. And uh, there's something here that I'm, I'm sort of not quite sort of, uh, getting from the presentation. And maybe I could get uh, clarification. Uh, 
some comments in the world addresses. We have heard the issue of national strengthening by some of them in terms of how they are localizing the efforts uh, for implementation. And then there is also uh, comments in terms of regional strategy uh, from the Pacific and how that is moving forward. But the issue of this is the issue of finance. Now, my question is, how do you see this process moving forward? Are we saying, and, and this is the question to everyone, are we saying that um, it's up to countries and region to secure, to look for those funding, to help them in terms of their implementation? Or do you perceive a broader coordination mechanism that sits yet put in place? Uh, because I, I think, as yes, all of you were aware, it's not just about our partners, it's not just about the UN system, it's not about capital uh, funding, uh, civil society. I think it's a combination of all of them. And somewhere along the line, I think we need to have some coordination mechanism where we can look at some of these plans, whether at the regional or national level, and, and see where the shortfalls are, where the gaps are in terms of funding. And then uh, the next question is how do we then go about bridging those gaps? And one of the things that uh, we will be putting in place in New York next month is the uh, Ambassadorial Coordination Committee. And that is going to be sourced from two countries from each of these three uh, regions, which will be the Caribbean, the Asian region, and the Pacific. And that is open to everyone. And then what we do is to keep track of all this development and uh, see where we can assist direct uh, resources or get the engagement and having conversations uh, with our partners and the IFIs and the APPs. Because I think at some point, we have to share that, those uh, those lessons and practices that we are engaging. Now, just two questions, one to Mauritius. Uh, I think you raised a very important uh, issue in terms of partners, and, and I think you, you referred to South-South and triangular cooperation. But I think it will be important, and I think you will find that in the address under uh, the action cluster that deals with uh, partnership is the reference to six city partnership. Now, that is something new under the address because I think uh, there was a deliberate decision to include that. What we say to our partners is that we ourselves need to demonstrate that we are also capable of helping us uh, before we ask them to assist. And I think that that is a sustainable way of maintaining partners, not just asking, but also demonstrating what we can bring to the table in terms of helping themselves. So I think you're absolutely right. And it's not meant to replace uh, South, North, North, South cooperation is meant to complement that. And then finally, uh, on this issue of early warning, which you referred to as well, I think uh, experience has demonstrated we're going to have a lot more of disaster. And I think, you know, what you said about needing to sort of work with institutions, whether it's early warning system, or DLR is extremely important. 
and we're already doing that. Perhaps uh, you've heard of SOC, uh, Systematic Observation Financing Limit, as well as Group, as well as RIP, Risk Informed Early Action Partnership. And I think that these are the sort of initiatives that small island in our state should be engaged in. And I think we did mention that specifically also in the uh, address. So I think those are sort of, I just mentioned those as concrete examples of, you know, how we can partner with some of these issues and to bring their expertise and support on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's I'll give Marcia the opportunity to respond and then I'll turn it to Jessica and this will be the final uh, commentation before I take a break from lunch. I can see Sylvan's to get to go for lunch. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I wonder whether I need to answer. <laughs> Uh, I, I didn't sense there was a question, but uh, thank you for elaborating further on what uh, I stated. Um, of course, um, the best place to go and learn about uh, how to deal with our issues is to go to people taking these issues. And this is where I think this uh, cooperation exchange of uh, good practices. Um, uh, important. And we are, um, most of us, all of us, already doing that uh, within the regional or sub regional organizations uh, that we belong to. For example, like the Commission, the Indian Ocean Commission. Uh, what we promise uh, needs to uh, reinforce is, um, or in some cases, in this case, is to have that uh, inter-regional exchange, uh, which um, is to me also okay. And I, I was uh, listening to our friend uh, from the Pacific Island program. Um, when it comes to states in the African region, we are we do with uh, all the islands. So uh, there is uh, this. Uh, Geographical spread that goes from China to the other side of the Atlantic. If so, uh, here I think uh, coordination and exchange of, of uh, experience in the real challenge is not best. That is why I want to thank you for. Thank you, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you. Uh, with respect to the private sector engagement in the implementation of ABAS, just wanted to touch on um, a few points uh, around our SIDS Global Business Network that um, OHR has spearheaded. We had a very dynamic discussion ahead of SIDS 4 in the SIDS Global Business Network Forum. 2024, um, where we um, came out with a set of really good recommendations and um, action points around the, the three, the four areas that we discussed during the meeting, including blue green economy developments, uh, community empowerment and local solutions, enabling business environment, and uh, I think what we touched on here is financing and investment for the implementation of ABAS. So we are um, having a webinar on the 6th of November uh, to go into those recommendations and how we can carry those forward. So we really invite um, the, the national focal points to engage with this process to see how we can contribute and, and, and share your account. Uh, insights and perhaps gain some from um, the organizations that will be involved. We have some private sector organizations 
as well as you know, the stakeholders and others involved in the process to, to bring out how we can uh, implement those uh, key recommendations from the forum. And you can find that information on our website. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, can I just thank everybody uh, for all your valuable uh, contributions in this uh, first session uh, of our meeting, uh, in particular the you know all our presenters and our discussions, but of course all of those, all of you who have made uh, interventions. Um, I think you all agree we have a very rich and diverse uh, discussion about unpacking others in the first part of the session, but also uh, in the second part of the, the mobilizing others and the relevance uh, of the Samoa pathway and the type of mutation and, and the lessons that we have learned uh, from the Samoa pathway. Uh, thank you again to everybody. Uh, we're now break for lunch, uh, and I'll just turn to see if there's any housekeeping uh, matters. But also thank you to all of those, all of you who are online. Uh, and I know we had some challenges uh, in terms of uh, connecting, so please bear with us, and we hope we will reconnect uh, after we've had our lunch break. Thank you very much. Just give them a round of applause. Now, uh, so we'll break for lunch now, as the, the outgoing moderator has said. We will break for lunch, we will head down to, towards the sea. Um, this, is, this is a strong breeze at the moment, so you'll, it's cool. And then uh, we will have our, our lunch, and then we'll be uh, here at about uh, 2.15 to make a 2.30 start. So we'll start at 2.30 on the dot. Thank you very much, and again, apologies for the glitches in the, the, the internet. I think the internet system is back on now, so it's on strong, so hopefully we will not have any glitches going forward from now. But then enjoy your lunch, and I'll see you all back here at 2.30. Thank you very much.